Okay, let's get started. So welcome everyone to our first lecture on machine learning. Um, nice to see you here in person and hopefully we can um, do this the whole semester. So that would be the best. So as you hear, I have a very strong accent when I speak English, right? So don't be worried when you ask something in, in English or something and you have, might have a beautiful French accent, that would be even nicer. But also with a Westphalian accent, it's totally fine. It's also totally fine to ask a question in German, of course, right? However, you will use English anyway in your job later on, and so this is a nice setup to practice, okay? Good, let's start with the administrative stuff. The first thing is here, now you see this is section one. So in my previous lectures, I have written there lecture one, lecture two, lecture three. Now the slides, the PDFs are sorted by topic, okay? So today we will have section one and possibly section two. And next time we will continue with section two where we kind of stopped and we continue with section three. So the sections are for each topic. Now there's a slide set, which is much less confusing for me and I think also for you, okay? Good, so let's get to the first slide. So administrative stuff, okay? So this is the, sh the standard stuff that you all need to know. So there are two lectures um, and you know already when and where it is. And then I typically have asked you for feedback after every lecture in Ilias, okay? So it's voluntarily, so you don't have to do that, but if you want, you can. So there you can anonymously tell me whether you liked the lecture or whether it was too fast or too slow or whether there are certain things you didn't understand at all. What was this letter P meaning, for example, or what is the matrix or what is the vector? You can ask anything, right? And I will try to answer these questions. And um, you don't have to give feedback, that's also okay. You can also just write it to Rocket Chat. But in Rocket Chat, basically everything is non-anonymously. -anonym so if you want to give anonymous feedback, use this Elias um, form. If you don't find it, send me an email, then I made a mistake with setting it up, okay? Um, the slides of the lecture will be on Cybo or Siebo. There is a public folder for this lecture. There are also private folders that I'm using for preparing the slides, but there's a public folder where you can download all the slides of the lectures and also the exercise sheets. And there's also a folder for uploading, okay? The links to all these folders you will find on Elias, yeah? Which I'm not sure whether it's already properly set up, but all the links will be on Elias where you have access to. The videos will be uploaded to Mediathek, hahu.de, if all works well. Otherwise, there are lots of old videos, okay? If you want to see the explanation four times, just go to the older lectures that I gave, okay? It's basically the same stuff. Maybe me a bit younger with more hair, but actually not really. And some in German, some in English, okay? Whatever you prefer. There will be also Übungen. So Übungen are these things where the exercises are explained. Um, we again, we have a great team of tutors, Tobias Oever, Maike Behrendt, Stefan Wagner, Liz Leutner, Christopher Orlovich and Sebastian Konietzny. Um, there are three dates. The Monday one is a highly unpopular one where no one goes typically, so we canceled it already, right? Even if one of you wants to go there, so it's not available anymore. But there are two more and Instead of having the Monday, we have a Q&A session, okay? Additionally, that is held as a video conference on Friday mornings, okay? And it will be led by Tobias, who's also here. Maybe you can send up, maybe you can also say a few words about the Q&A session. Yeah. Um, okay, so the idea behind the Q&A session is that maybe you, you want to speak here. So the idea behind the Q&A session is that if you want to participate at this um, lecture purely online, you can watch videos and then you can use this Q&A session to ask questions or you can uh, participate at the Übungen in person um, like, like we all were used to a couple of years ago. So in the Übungen we will also explain all the exercises and you will also given the chance to, to ask questions. And of course, you can uh, anytime send me a rocket chat message or you can send me an email or whatever you prefer and ask questions. Are there any more questions? So, okay. Okay, not yet. Um, also, Tobias was uh, talking about videos. So the solutions of the exercises, there will be also a video recorded for each of the solutions typically that you can also watch online, which I think is great. It's a lot of work but I think it's, it's very valuable for you. 
And the good thing is, once you record it, you can recycle it every year, okay? So it's also useful to just have it. Um, in the Übungen, it's always good to come prepared. Prepared means you have already the new exercise sheet, and you looked at it already, and you identified already the stuff that you didn't get, okay, that you don't understand. You can also come with a partial solution and say, I'm stuck here and there, and then you can discuss it, okay? Depends on you what you make out of it. Then we have a chat, which is rocket chat. That's where you can all discuss, and we will do this uh, announcement, and that is our preferred channel of communication, okay? So that is the easiest. It's the easiest for us. Actually, I think it's also the easiest for you. The good thing is the rocket chat scales very nicely. So if you have a question about exercise 1A, yeah, you ask it in rocket chat, and possibly in two minutes you get an answer from one of you, right? That then tells you, oh, it's a vector is this and this and that, or some, something stupid. So ask anything there and you can help each other. But we also look into it, so possibly also in after one minute, Tobias has already answered and gave you something to go on working. So that is very useful, I think. Okay, good. And then there's Elias for all the links and for the feedback form. Let me rewire my cable again. So this is, it goes that way. So admin stuff number two. So please use Rocket Chat. Yeah, of course you can send us an email, but when I read an email somehow and I think it's something that should have gone to Rocket Chat, it creates negative energy. Okay, and negative energy is not good, right? So that's kind of painful. However, if you think no, I really have to do it via email, then do it via email, right? So if it's a good reason, then that's fine. It's also okay from time to time to create negative energy, so that's okay. If there's enough positive energy, then it's okay. Good, so the exercises. The sheets, so those will be like PDF files, will be weekly on Siebo, and the rules are that two students should hand in one submission, okay? Um, please follow the instructions very closely. Yeah? So the instructions are about how to, how to use file names, what file names should you use for your zip file to upload. If you follow the instructions on the first, first of all, you give us a sign that you are an intelligent computer science student, so that's always good to know, right? If you don't follow the instructions, we have doubts that you are a super intelligent computer science student and cannot follow some formal rules, okay? So the other thing is annoying because we have these super excellent tutors who write automated scripts, right, that automatically um, generate email messages for your reviews for the exercises and send them out automatically from the shell and so super cool stuff that only works if the namings are correct, right? So it's not very robust. So we are not using AI technology for this yet, but we are using some non-robust stuff that works very well and is very robust if the file names are correct. The other instruction is um, don't write stuff with a shitty handwriting, okay? So something like, I don't know, um, whatever. Um, so what letter is this? So this could be a new, it could be a V, so it could be many things. What is this? It could be a P, it could be a gamma, it could be anything. So if you have enough of these symbols on your sheet, then basically the set of solutions that is generated by these letters might include the true solution but it's not the task of the tutors to find out, okay? So you should nicely write things up, yeah? so that you really like it and that you would uh, show it to your whatever. You, you should be proud of it, yeah? So show it to your grandmother, and if she thinks, oh, that wouldn't have been allowed when I was a student, okay? If she said that, then it's probably not a good idea to submit it like that. If you have a very, very bad handwriting, Write very, very slowly, okay? Or later your solutions, okay? That's also acceptable, of course. Okay, so those are the instructions. So the first sheet will be available this week already. Question? Uh, yes, so it has uh, two instructions. Uh, two at least maximum or also one at least. Ah, okay, yes, very important question. So ideal is two. Yeah, so the one thing is you should work with someone together. So that's something very useful, also necessary for working in a job. The other thing is it's limiting the number of submissions, okay? So there are already lots of students here. I'm assuming there are even more that are purely online, and so that we couldn't handle all the submissions individually. So it has these two factors, okay? 
when you work together with someone, you should meet with them, yeah? Like, uh, make your Discord channel or something and work together on it if you want to work on a distance and then switch them off on and then you can work and discuss on the exercises. So it's sometimes when people say, okay, I do exercise one, you do exercise two and we never see each other, okay? That might be okay, but actually it's nicer if you work together. So everyone should understand everything. There's an exam, of course, and here's something new. People who attended the last semester's lecture already know it. So when you want to be admitted to the exam, you don't need any more 50% of the points overall in the semester, but you need 50% on each exercise sheet, okay? So students are typically very disappointed when they see the, the rule, because like they are like, at the beginning, they are working very hard, and then maybe after 60% of the exercises, they reach the 50% level of the points. And then comes this email. So how many exercise sheets are there? It's a, there's some, some questions that typically comes like beginning with half of the lecture. And then they stop working on it, okay? And those students often fail in the exam, yeah? So for that reason, now you have to have 50% of the points in every sheet, okay? It also means if you are two students and student one is doing exercise one, student two is exercise two, you are at risk of failing, right? If the other student is not a super excellent computer science student, but maybe only slightly so, okay? So please look at the whole thing that you reach these 50%. However, we, we know life is complicated, so you will have two jokers, okay? And if you are, at, at, you can, leave the jokers until the very end, or you use them at the very beginning, right? And then it's more exciting to be a student in this class. Um, however, um, we are typically quite strict with it, okay? And it works very well. Students are complaining about it. We know, we know, we have our reasons. And it works very well for the students who follow it. Good, the grade at the end is the final grade of the exam, okay? So the exercise sheets are for exercising. They are not the grade at the end. Any questions about the admin stuff? Yes? How long will the exam be? Uh, the exam will be exactly 100 minutes, and you will get exactly 100 points. So that's typically how it is. And also the exercise sheets, they are exactly 100 points. So it's like all very normed, yeah? So right. it's a metric write, system. Write it down by hand? Uh, yeah, typically, yes. Yeah, you have to write it down. But if, if you have a good reason for not to do it, you can also use your mouth or the left hand or feet or anything else, or also someone else who's sitting next to you who writes it for you. Ah, the Übungen. No, you can do it by hand, you can use Leite, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can write it down in PDF. Yeah, yeah. Right. Of course, also if you s submit a PDF file, is it easier for us to find plagiate, right? We can just compare the checksum, so that's easier. So don't do plagiate, by the way, right? That should be obvious by now. Yeah, you are not beginners anymore. If you are here and you are doing plagiate, you might be in the wrong topic, right? You might be sitting here, you want to learn it, but then you don't learn it, right? I mean, what's the point of being here? Then I would go elsewhere and do whatever, psychology or some other branch if it's not really your thing, okay? So please do the exercises yourself. Please fail yourself with the exercises, okay? That's much better than you're making progress, okay? Of course, you will fail at the exercises, and then you discuss it on Rocket Chat. I'm failing, I don't get it, and then you get a tip from us, and then you won't fail possibly, right? Or you get some help in the Übungen, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so please use it. So use all these things that we offer. Any other questions? Yeah, where do we have to submit our... Oh, it will be also on Cybo. There's a submission folder, and I think the instructions will be on the first sheet. Yeah, so for you, you go to the Elias website. On the Elias website, there are all the links. There's a link to the submission folder, I guess, and there's a link to the public folder, okay, and there's a link to the Mediathek, maybe even, okay, and um, the, so Ilias is like the central point for the links, and then we only use it for the feedback, okay? Anything else? If not, um, here's some literature. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and in a way, it's irrelevant, this question, since we... <laughs> Have a different rule. No, I guess like 12 or, no, 12 or 13, something like this. 13 or 14, something like this. Yeah, so approximately, yeah. Um, 
there are some free books, so we are not using any of these books, okay? So this is like my personal take on machine learning, and if you go to another university, to a different professor, she will have a totally different view of machine learning, yeah? That's how it is. I don't think that it's as standardized as linear algebra. So there are lots of resources for you to look at, okay? So you get one presentation for linear regression in my lecture, okay? But then you can go to YouTube and you can watch 10 or 100 other presentations on linear regression, okay? And everyone has a slightly different emphasis on, on different aspects and you have to make up your own mind and at the end pass the exam, of course, okay? So you have to have my point of view for until the exam and then you can do other things, okay? Good, so here are some books. They are all for free. Um, last year the Kevin Murphy book was still non-free, but it's, I found it, so it's also, he has a GitHub repository where you can download the book. He has some three books now, some really nice books, and it's good to have them all in your repertoire, right? Because often, I, at least that's for me, when I get into a new topic, I read something about it, and then I don't get it, okay? And then I read more. And I s slowly to start to understand what is going on, and then the more books and the more perspectives from different people I read, at some point I think I'm on top of it and I understand it, and that would be the same for you. And it depends on your background, whether you are a math person, certain things might be super simple for you where I'm telling you because someone asks a question and I explain it, I explain what a plus sign is, and you think, come on, we learned it in elementary school. And then there are other topics from computer science, Floyd Warshall algorithm or something. If you're a CS person, you think, oh, that's so boring. We had to, to, we had to compute the O of something of it. And the math person might think, I've never seen this before. Please tell me more details. Yeah, so be flexible here. Then there are some very good non-free books. Um, they are also for your pleasure, right? So you can um, go to the library and have a look at them and see how they complement the lecture, okay? They, they, if you're really interested in this machine learning topic, actually you want to learn everything, right? And you want to see all topics. And so there are many books on this and many different perspectives. So the Chris Bishop book is also a very good textbook, for example. Um, I think this one, Probability Theory, The Logic of Science, I like it, kind of. It's not a machine learning book, though. It's more like this, this guy is a physicist, and he has a very interesting Bayesian perspective on physics and on all these things. And some of the stuff I also took from his book, okay, in particular the stuff that we've seen today. And I think you can also get a copy of it online somewhere, okay? Good, that's the literature. So please ask questions on Rocket Chat. So this is a link, but whatever, yeah. So, any more questions to the administrative stuff? Yes. Um, so you can shift from these groups arbitrarily. And the other thing is if you have a team of two persons, you can also randomly, if you find out that your partner is not the super excellent CS person, then you can of course switch, right? Or if your partner finds out that you are not the super excellent CS person, um, you can switch both. So it's very flexible. It should just keep the amount of um, uh, work for the TAs like realistic and it should, kind, uh, should encourage you to discuss the stuff, right? When you're sitting alone on these things, they are typically too difficult, at least for me, and then when you work together with someone with two brains, you're much better on it, okay? But then the scores will be assigned to your name at the end, so you can switch arbitrarily. Is that correct? Yes, very good. Any other questions? The other thing is um, always, um, I mean, I'm seeing you now that you are not virtual and I'm also seeing you in 3D, which is cool, yeah? But um, you can also acoustically influence the lecture by asking questions, right? So always feel free to interrupt me and to ask something. Typically, if you think, oh, I'm so stupid, I'm not even getting this, you're probably not the only person in the room with that question, okay? So please be the, the um, courageous one who asked the question. That's always helpful. So, so far so good. Let's get started. So what is machine learning? Let me try to give a definition. It's my personal definition. Thank you, Tobias. Bye-bye. Maybe you can leave the door open. Very good. So what is machine learning? So this is like the introduction that I typically get. So this is the starting point. This is like CS 101, 
Einführung in die Informatik or Einführung in die Programmierung, so introduction to programming. So this is a simple example what we as CS persons can do, right? So we have an unsorted sequence of digits, right? Of course, this is an abstracted of an unsorted sequence of anything that you can compare. And you want to write a program that outputs now a sorted sequence. And we learned everything about it, right? That is known at least. We know we would use quicksort maybe, right? Or maybe for only five, maybe there's even a closed form solution for this, maybe, I don't know. And we also know something about the running time, so we know the problem very well. We, we could all implement it, right? And that is a simple computer programming example. The goal is to write a program here, okay, for this task. Now here's a difficult example. It's not difficult anymore though, but this is like a typical machine learning example where we have a handwritten digit. So this is a picture of a digit that you put on a sheet of paper and you took a photo of it. And then you want to write a computer program where the input now is this, this image, which is basically a matrix, right? A digital camera is a matrix generator, right? Don't tell it your friends, but it is. Yeah, it even, it's creating a tensor, a three by, 1024 by 1024 or something of numbers, okay? And these numbers, this big tensor or matrix, yeah, is the input to a computer program where the output then at the end should be one of the digits, okay? One of 10 different discrete classes. And that is a much harder program to write, okay? And when you are living in the 80s, yeah, where logical AI or expert systems or these kind of things are super popular and also at industrial applications, you might have started with having rules, trying to find like horizontal lines, so you design filters for that, and maybe lines on diagonals, and maybe also how they are put together. And then you set, come up with a set of logical rules, yeah, that must be, that you can apply to this matrix, then to decide what digit it is. Unfortunately, it's working so-so, and not very robust, these kind of sets of rules. So it's not a very robust solution to the problem. However, um, our brains are very good at these kind of things, at image recognition, for example, or it's called also called pattern recognition. So how are we doing it? And so there's a different approach, a so-called connectionist approach, which is also popular already since the 60s, and which has been also popular throughout the time, which is basically having a neural network, right? Having a super complicated function of some image filters, and then at the end comes some output. But typically, the function that you give is not done yet, but it has lots of parameters. So you don't tell it before which filters to use. You don't tell it the exact structure of the computation. You only give it the possibility to be super complicated and you train it on data, okay? So that is the now the basic idea. So we have a difficult example and in order to get our program here, we are not writing a set of logical rules or something of if then else, but instead, we are collecting lots of input-output examples, for example, from students who are writing numbers on exercise sheets or something, and then they can be automatically processed. And we get these pairs of things. So we have handwritten digits, and we have the true solution for those, okay? And we have many of those, and we use that information to create a program for the task up there, okay? And that is machine learning, okay? At least that is my definition of machine learning, but I think it's a very useful one. So, to recap, as computer scientists, we are interested in writing programs which transform one input in another output, okay? If the input is something complicated like an image, um, then it might be very difficult to program it by hand, and instead we are using automated programming, which is using data to create automatically a program, okay? And for example, deep learning is using some neural networks to process the input into the output and lots of parameters to tune, okay? And these parameters, they are tuned from the data, okay? So that is the basic idea of machine learning. So for me, machine learning is automated programming. So it's a natural extension of CS101, okay? So it's like one step further. Of course, practically, what are you doing? You're writing a program that can automatically program, okay? So in a way, it's more like writing a compiler for programs, yeah? So you are writing a program that gets data, and then it creates a program that can solve the input-output task, okay? So that is machine learning. Unfortunately, it's not super straightforward. Typically, the task of a data scientist is 
to start with one solution and then try another one, try another one, try another one, and try another one, and compare them and find out which is the best one, and then you can chip it in the next cell for generation, for speech recognition or for whatever recognition, okay? So it's not super straightforward as I'm telling you here, but this is like the conceptual point of view. Good, so far so good. So why is that now coming? Why not before? So why in the 80s we had like all these logical approaches, even industrialized, so really making big money like today deep learning is doing? Because with the internet and with new devices, we collect lots and lots of data very, very quickly, okay? So today it's very easy to get lots of data from which we can learn. The digit example that I gave you before, before was from the MNIST digit set, and that's actually an old digit set, I think, from 90-something, and it was already used in the 90s, right? But it was a bit cumbersome, and people were not, the computers were not fast enough to really process it super well, okay? It was still a bit complicated, so it wasn't a breakthrough. But now, we are having so much information, so we have, so this is an old slide, so we have something like billions of web pages, we have many hours of video uploaded every minute, okay, extreme amount of data. We have genome sequences in biology, right? Now you can, you can even get a USB device that you connect to your laptop and you can use it to do sequencing, for example. So it's quite amazing. You can generate so much information. Um, we have super big telescopes with super high resolution and they are constantly making a movie of the universe, okay? And that's lots of data and so on and so forth, everywhere, okay? So, on the one hand, this is us giving us many tasks for machine learning because there are many non-trivial questions here, right? So, for example, in these genome sequences, find the structure, right? So, understand what's changing from one species to another species, right? Understand what an ill person, what's the bug, where's the bug in the DNA, right? So, where's the problem? So, maybe I can find out and I can just give it the right, give the person the right substance and the person can live a healthy life. So there are many interesting questions that are more from the style of classifying an MNIST digit, right? Which is, you can describe what you want, right? But you cannot give a set of rules to answer the question. But you have lots of data, okay? And that's where machine learning can do it. So we have lots of data and we have lots of interesting questions and now we also have the computing power, okay, to do something complex. So there are several things. The theory of machine learning is already older, okay? There's already a chapter on machine learning in books from the 80s and 70s on AI, okay? Learning was always like a topic, but it was only one topic among many, but now it's like the dominating topic, which is kind of solving tasks in many different branches of AI, for example. Then there are now super fast computers, so the good thing for computer scientists is we don't have to be so creative, right? Don't tell it anyone else. But the good thing is we just wait for the next generation of GPUs or of computers, and then we run the same programs as our colleagues from the 80s, and we get new results, right? Suddenly we can do things that weren't possible before because of the raw computing power, okay? So that's a very nice situation. So that is like the overview, what is machine learning, okay? So here comes the example data set. Now, this is not a super big one. It's the iris flower data set. It's basically this. So we have these iris flowers, three of them, and then there's um, a statistician, Ronald Fisher, a hundred years ago, and there's a, a botanist, botanicist, I don't know what it's in English, ein botaniker, yeah? I think his, his name is Anderson, but you should look it up on the webpage on the iris data set. And he collected an interesting set of data. So he took three different species of iris flowers and he measured like the lengths of these blossoms, okay? And as you can see here, there are some leaves of the blossom here. These ones are, these are the main ones and then there are some secondary ones. And one is called the sepal and the other one is called the petal, okay? Look it up on the iris flower data set Wikipedia page, the exact details. And they have a width and a length, okay? And so, what a nice task. You are a botanicist. You go into the botanical garden, and then with your ruler, you really measure the length of these things, and you make a nice data set, okay? What a crazy idea 100 years ago, okay? Can we infer from data something about these flowers? When we think about it, of course, right? I mean, there are some plants who have small blossoms and some have large ones. And maybe we can even distinguish different species 
of iris that have the same color, right? But of course they are different, different species. And so they, they made a table, and this is an, um, part of the table. So basically it has 50 rows. So for each of these species, they were measuring 50 plants or 50 blossoms, okay? And then writing these things up, okay? So this is the data. So let me switch to a Jupyter notebook where I'm now showing you basically um, how to do machine learning with this data. Okay, so I hope you can read it all. So this notebook is also in the public folder so you can play around. Yeah, I'm trying to have a Jupyter notebook per lecture. Let's see whether I can uh, do this, all the lectures, but that would be, it's kind of fun to do some programming as well. So here I'm using some Python libraries. So Python is the lingua franca for machine learning. There are some other languages like Yulia, which are also very nice and worth considering, but like the standard language where you get most of the toolboxes for is currently Python, okay? And I think recently, a couple of days ago, it's even became the most popular language among all of them. So I think on these, there's a certain programming language popularity index and I think it took over C and Java, okay? So it's a very nice language. So why is Python so nice? Because it's a simple language which looks like scripting, but it has many fancy features. You can also program it like Lisp or some functional programming language. So you can be very sophisticated with it, but you can also be very simple with it, okay? So this is my personal style, how to import functions from libraries. Many hate it, my TAs hate it to do it that way, right? Typically they say, no, you should do it like this, import whatever numpy as np, and then you always do np dot and call the function, or you import whatever plotly express as px, and then you use this px. I'm coming from MATLAB, so I want to have short commands, and I'm not getting confused with this. I think the code is more readable. Then I'm doing here something that you won't be able to do during the um, lecture, I'm using in the library sklearn, okay? Of course, you are not allowed to use it because you should learn what sklearn is doing, right? At the end of the lecture, you should be able to write the sklearn library yourself. So you need to understand how these things work. However, since you will be now the machine learning expert and then your fellow students come, oh, here in whatever Germanistic, I have this super interesting handwriting of Heinrich Heine, can you write me some machine learning stuff to do the hand recognition? Then you say, no problem, I can do it. I'm using sklearn and I know what the functions are doing. Okay, of course you should use these libraries, but in this lecture we won't use them. In this lecture we are using a linear algebra library NumPy and create everything in NumPy. Okay, however, when you have an application in real life, please use the library, right? It's all there. So I'm also using it here. In particular, I can easily load the iris data. So let's load it. So now it's loaded. So what does it mean to be loaded? Um, basically, I have this iris object and it has some slots. It has a data slot where the data now is, uh, let me see. The data is basically this table. Yeah, so each column here is as 50 rows. So 50 for each species. So I have 150 blossoms measured and each of them has four numbers, so it's like a four by 150 matrix, right? If you don't know what a matrix is, please ask, yeah? Or find out yourself. I don't mind if you don't know it yet, right? Just find it out yourself or ask during the lecture. That's the same holds for anything, right? We all have different back backgrounds. Today we would say diverse backgrounds, but let's say we have different backgrounds. And don't be worried if there's something that you don't know, right? You should be only worried Right? If then after you find out that you don't know, then a week later you still don't know, okay? So that's when you should get worried, but not if you don't know stuff. So we should expect that the data is basically a four by 150 matrix. Uh, let's check that. By the way, that's how I wrote the code. I write a few lines. Now they look really nice, but at the beginning you are fiddling around, you are reading documentation, and you need to find out how the stuff works and then always you need to check whether it's like that, how you would expect it. And, okay, the prediction was four by 150, and I'm almost right. So, okay, the rows are 150, and then there are four columns. Always double check this kind of stuff. Then there's another one, these um, names that I'm assigning. Let's have a look at that one. Okay, so those are the names of the different dimensions. 
Why am I having it here? Who cares? I'm having it here to have nice plots, okay? I want to have nice labels on the plots. That's why I'm having them here. Um, let's have a look at the y. So what is y? Okay, y is an array of zeros, ones, and twos, and it's basically the true class. So the first 50 examples are class zero. The next one is class two. Uh, the, the other Iris Citosa, the other one Iris Virginica, and the Iris something else, the uh, Iris Heisenensis, maybe, I don't know. And let's look up the, the true names. So those are the true names. Ah, okay, where's the color? Okay, so those are the ones. So this is now an array of names. So it took a while for me to, uh, to write the code like this. I also don't write it down. Yeah, that's your experience as well when you start playing with these things. You will have to look up the documentation. You look what are these slots. But then at some point, kind of, you have it right, and then you keep it. Ideally, you can also document it, okay? So here I could write down for plots or for whatever, labeling axis, I want to use these ones, and these ones I want to use for the legend of my plot, okay? So document it. It's not, it's for yourself in five years when you look again at the plot, uh, at the code, okay? So document your code. Good, so far so good. Then I, I'm using, um, what plotting library I, I, am I using? I'm using Plotly Express. I like it a lot, it's quite nice. We can also use matplotlib or something like that. So I'm not sure what they're doing in the exercises. I think so far they use matplotlib, but after seeing this beautiful notebook, they might switch to Plotly. So let's see. So basically what I'm, how I'm plotting it, I'm doing a scatter 3D plot. I know there are four coordinates, but I'm ignoring the fourth one. Okay, so I'm only plotting three of them. And the way this plotly is working, you have these named arguments of this function and you give the x-axis a vector of numbers and you give the y-axis another vector of numbers which must have exactly the same length as the, length as the previous one. And the z-axis I also give some numbers. I'm using here i, j, k because I wanted to easy, easily shuffle them around when I want to see something else. But for consistency, there are constants here when I use this function more often. Then there's something interesting. You can also give some variable color. You can also give it a vector of numbers. And then it will use the vector of numbers to give different colors. So that's very useful. We can use now basically the labels. And this is something that looks complicated. It's uh, like a list comprehension in Python. So basically, I don't want to have a list of numbers as the input for color if I would do that. It would be a continuous variable, but I want to make it discrete because then the legend looks nicer. So I'm using now my names, right? I'm kind of generating a new array where I'm now having the names listed exactly like that. So this is Python internal. You should learn about this list comprehension, so that's very useful. And then there are labels. Okay, that's something else that I'm defining here, that I'm having the right labels. It also took a while to fiddle around to get it like this. So let's apply it, show iris, x, y, and hopefully now we get a nice plot that I can show you. Okay, good, this looks good. And I can also turn it around like this, so after seeing this, you all want to use Plotly, I'm, I'm sure. So I can also zoom in and whatever. So it's really nice. And as you can see, uh, we also have here now the correct names on these things, which is very useful. And I'm also having here the correct names for this stuff. That's also very useful, okay? Um, I spent, from on the whole notebook, I spent like two hours getting the plot looking like this, and then maybe 10 minutes on the rest. That's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. And it's good invested time. Yeah? Now, suppose you are giving a lecture and you want to show the plots to students, it's so nice to have these labels here and to have everything on this here. Suppose you have a customer, it's so nice to have like a nice plot of the data of the customer, right? So that's something very useful to have. So spend time on it. Also, because I was using the function completely wrong. I did some stupid mistake in my call for Scatter3D, and I could only find out by finding out that's so weird. The sepal length goes from 1 to 150. How can this be? Okay, and that was because I was using the function in the wrong way. Okay, so spend some time. Look at the data. There's a famous gorilla experiment. There's, it's a psychology experiment with a gorilla, but there's also another gorilla experiment for data scientists, where basically you have a data set, and when you look at the scatter plot, you see a gorilla. And if you don't see it, kind of the task is really difficult. If you see the scatter plot and you see what the data is, 
suddenly the task gets simple. And the same applies here. Always try to visualize your data, okay? Have a look at it. Good, so what are we seeing? We're seeing these three columns of my table. The fourth one is ignored, and I'm having different colors for the different species. And as we can see already, okay, there's a cluster of the Cetosa one, so it's kind of looking different. Let's see, so which one was the Cetosa? This one? Okay, looks like this one has very, um, the width of one of them is very small compared to the other. That might be the thing, or the length of these things is much larger than the other one. So there's something funny happening here, and let's find out, so which is it? So it's the, the, seep, the petal length. Okay, this is not nice here, but this is the, the right one, the petal length. Maybe one of you finds out how, how I could increase the area here, so the area is a bit limited. So the petal length is very large for the blue ones, okay? So it looks like it is. No, actually it's very small. Oh, weird, whatever. So this is giving the, like, the botanicist some information, also whether there's something wrong with the labeling or something. Yeah, so please look at it. Okay, next, we want to do machine learning now with it. So we want to use this data to learn something. So what would be an interesting task here? So the botanicist goes to Ronald Fisher and asks him, so I have this data set, can you kind of tell me whether they, all, whether they are all coming from the same species or whether they are coming from different species, okay? So the botanicist just dumps these four by 150 matrix on the table and then Ronald Fisher can start to do calculations and do linear regression and do whatever they want. For example, clustering. We will see clustering in a second. First, we do something simpler. We want to do classification. Then Ronald Fisher says, oh, first I want to do something simpler. Please give me also the class labels and I'm trying to program a function yeah, that can automatically tell which species it is just by looking at these four numbers. And this is the so-called classification task. So before um, I show you already the code, so this is now a classifier and then we will check how good it is. However, before we do that, we do the following trick, which is very important. We split our data set in two halves. In a training set, that is the one yeah, that the botanicist put on the table of Ronald Fisher, but he has a secret other set that he left in his office, and that was the test data. Okay? So he wants to find out how good is Mr. Fisher at classifying these things. So he gets part of the data, only 75 examples, randomly selected, that is the training set, and the botanicist, she has the other 75 in her office, and first the, uh, Mr. Fisher can do whatever he wants, and then he just gets the 75 by four table without the labels of the test set, and then we really know whether it works or not, okay? So in a way, this is all statistics. And actually, the whole computation here is statistics. And at some point, it was called computational statistics. Now it's called machine learning, yeah? So also, here's a big overlap. However, now what is statistics relative to machine learning? I mean, Ronald Fisher is a statistician, right? So why is he now the machine learning? He doesn't have a computer anyway. The thing is, the methods are overlapping very much. But the machine learning is coming more from the computer science branch. and um, coming from the artificial intelligence perspective, trying to have intelligent robots running around or at least um, vacuum cleaning our houses or something like that, okay? And the statisticians coming from a different branch of science, okay? So they have different tools that they work with. But at the end, the methods have a very large overlap. However, so the machine learning person is always happy for a new statistical method Great, yeah, I want to see the algorithm, give me the R code, I will translate it into Python, so that's in the task of the machine learning person. Um, on the other hand, the machine learning person is also inventing their own message, me uh, methods which might be a bit more applied than the statistician. The statistician says, I want to have a consistency proof, otherwise I don't try my method. The machine learning person says, I'm fine if the test error is okay. Okay, I don't care, I don't care for the consistency proofs. So those are like the extremes of these characters. To be honest, also the machine learning person has a split brain, yeah? Uh, she would love to have a um, consistency proof for the new algorithm. However, we don't have it yet, but it's working very, very well, and I'm making tons of money with it, right? So 
Who cares for the consistency proof? But then 10 years later, a super clever statistician comes and proves that the method is also okay. So they are like different communities. Statistician is more like a mathematical person, wants to see proofs and all these things. The machine learning person is more an engineering person, wants to get things working, right, and can try it on new data, for example. Anyway, okay, so we need to split now our data in training and test, and sklearn is has a function for this, the so-called train test split function. Okay, it's splitting it in 50% test and 50% training. And I'm having a random state here given, 42, of course 42. And that is kind of allowing us that everything is reproducible. So I can do always the same experiments at the same time. Uh, the, the random assignments will be always the same, right? Of course, Maybe I should also shuffle it if I want to do certain statistical tests. I need to randomize it, right? So I'm also a statistician, kind of, sometimes. But here I prefer to be deterministic in this, right? Because then the nice demo that I made at home should now look exactly the same as at home on my other machine. Good, so let's split it into two parts. And um, let's look at the code here. So I'm starting with x and y. And they were sorted, right? The first examples were one, then another, and another. Through randomization, now I should have in X train and in Y train, I should have all of the different ones, okay? So first, let's check the shape. So that's fine, 75 by four, so it's half of it. Um, let's look at the labels, because I want to avoid that in my training set, there are only examples of the first class. Um, okay, so that's also good. And it looks kind of mixed, okay? And here you should also check that maybe your training set and your test set kind of has examples from all the different classes, okay? Now, if you are super duper careful, yeah, you would also not trust the system at all, yeah, and look for an example here in this set of things. Let's say take the first row of X, check the label, and then search the first row from X and search it in train and test whether it's still there and whether it got the correct label, right? So kind of we are, as computer scientists, you always need to check everything that you do, in particular when you use some library from someone else that you didn't write yourself. And if you've wrote it yourself, you should even be more careful. Good, then what am I doing here? Now I want to have an X all and a Y all where the first 50 examples are training and the second 50 examples are test. Yeah, so basically now I'm stacking the train and test set on top of each other. Why do I want it? I want to have it for nice plots, okay? And I'm creating here yet another label, the train test label, which is basically having a text label for the first 50 examples called train and another one called test. Why do I bother? Because then I get nice plots, okay? So let's visualize the data. And here you see another cool feature. You can also give some variable symbol some vector of stuff. And I give it the vector of train and test strings, okay? And by that, I'm having different symbols. I have circles and open circles. Okay, so let's look at the plot. So this is then how the plot looks like. And you see, um, I'm getting a nice legend. So I have versicolor train and versicolor test. Okay, let's zoom in a bit. And there you see now this is, this scatter plot look, should look exactly the same as the one before, but now some of them are test examples, some of them are train examples. Okay, I I'm, I'm hope you're not not bored already, but when you work really yourself on these things, you have to go slowly through this kind of code when you write it. And you have to look at your variables all the time to be really sure that they are doing what you want, okay? Um, I, 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 um, I tell you a secret, right? I did math diploma when I was young. And when I was switching to computer science, I thought, so as a math person, Everything is obvious, right? I know how these algorithms work. I understand them. I could even write down a proof. And then I implement it and I get 100 bucks, okay? And these 100 bucks, okay, yeah, yeah, I know. Ah, yeah, here's a semicolon, there's something. And then everything is compiling, but the code is not working, okay? And the reason is that the, the mathematical mind is slightly different than the computer scientist's mind. So the computer scientist's mind needs to make sure that every step in the recipe is doing what it's supposed to, to do. And the mathematician thinks that it's doing the right thing, but you're not testing it, right? Because you are used to handwritten proofs. And so important is that you always check every line of your code, check the sizes of the matrices, check that everything is as you want to have it, okay? So that's very important. Good, it's so important, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on it. Okay, now we have the train and test set. 
So let's use our first problem here. So it's an example of supervised learning. So what is supervised learning? Supervised means that there's a supervisor. So where's the supervisor here? So basically we have data and we have the information from our botanicist what species those are. So she, the botanicist, is the supervisor here. She's giving us the true labels and she's also giving it to the machine or to Mr. Fisher. Okay? So it's a supervised learning setup. And um, basically now this is a typical pattern that you see very often in Python toolboxes for machine learning. You have a constructor that is now constructing us a classifier object, okay? And the input are typically the hyperparameters. So this is a one nearest neighbor classification and it's a very descriptive name. So it's just looking for the closest neighbor in this data set here and assigning it the same label. So if I have a new point over here and I want to assign it a label with the one nearest neighbor classifier, I'm looking for the closest point to that one. And if that's blue, it also gets blue. Okay, so that's the one nearest neighbor classifier. And you can also have the two or three or five nearest neighbor classifier, and then you would do a majority vote, okay? And of course, if you have two and only two classes, yeah, there are some subtleties, what's happening, the voting could be even. So maybe you want to use a prime number, something, then you are, then you are fine. Good, so this is now generating a classification object, and here's nothing trained yet. So this NN object just knows its hyperparameter the number of neighbors I should look at is one, and that's it. Then it has a method fit, and in sklearn, all the learning methods have this subfunction dot fit, and you feed it in the inputs and the outputs, okay? In a supervised learning problem, you give it the inputs and the outputs, and then the nn fit will learn the parameters of the model. So after calling this fit function, this nn is kind of adjusted to the data at hand, okay? How does it work for the one nearest neighbor classification? Basically write down all the examples and keep them for later on so that you can look up examples and find nearest neighbors, okay? So when we have fit some data to it, now we can predict it on new data, but let's first try it on our training data, right? It should work on the training data. So let's apply it to the training data and this will generate us a long vector of class labels and we can compare it with the true la class labels, right? And this is now, um, basically I could put brackets here, maybe that makes it more clear. So here I'm creating now a vector of true and falses, okay? So this is a vector of true and falses. I can typically also do computations with this vector when I'm now trying to sum up stuff. Um, the stuff switches from true switches to one and false switches to zero and then you can do computations with it and calculate averages like the mean. So I print the, the basically how good it is now and then I show the data and I want to have open circles for the wrong ones. Okay, so let's do that. So first I need to fit the data. Of course, in k-nearest neighbor classifier, how expensive is it? It's an O of one operation because you just need to store a pointer to the big training data matrix. You don't have to go through the matrix. So it's really cheap. But it gets expensive when you want to predict someone. You get a data point and you have to go through the whole list. So at prediction time, it's more expensive than one nearest neighbor. So let's do it. And we get an accuracy of 1.0. So everything is perfect. And we won't see any of them that are false. So they are all correct. Of course, you can always be your own nearest neighbor, right? and then basically it's kind of trivial. So it's more interesting to use other data. The botanicist, she comes back and says, okay, Ronald, I didn't tell you the truth. There are not 75 examples, there are, 70, there are 150 examples. So here are other examples, but I kept the labels in my room, okay? I will check later, okay? And you get a grade for it. Good, so let's do that. Let's predict on the test set. So those are the test examples, and we can compare, of course, to calculate now, the true thing, um, we need to compare it with the test, with the true label. So the NN predict is done by Ronald Fisher and the equal equal Y test is done by the botanicist, okay? And then we get, again, a vector of truths and false which tell us how good we were. So let's do that and we get 97% accuracy, okay? The accuracy means now how ma what percentage was correct and this was perfect, almost, okay? So let's look at the almost perfect. 
So basically now this is plotting the test data, and there are two examples here which are circles. Let's see. So those are basically the wrong examples here. Also, that's something important to do. You train a classifier on your data, find out why didn't it perform good on the mistakes. So what are the mistakes? How do the examples look like? Okay? There are different ways how the story could go on. One way would be the botanicist said, oh, that's weird, example 75 is wrong. Why is it wrong? Let's go back to the garden. Let's again have a look at the flower and see, oh, the label was wrong. Okay, so that si sometimes can happen also in real data, right? Or, oh, that is an interesting thing that's almost looking like the other species, but from the color thing, I see that it's the other one, right? But from the shape, it looks very much like, like the, in this case, the Virginica, okay? Good, another way to visualize it, since we are doing one nearest neighbor, I can do here some Pythonic way of getting the list of wrong examples, again, with some list comprehension. You can figure it out how I did it. It's, it's nice code. And I can show it now together with the training set. I want to see the wrong examples here, okay? So this is the training set. And here I can have a look and I find out that this guy here that is wrong possibly has this as its nearest neighbor in the training set. And that's why it got the wrong label, okay? Uh, similarly, this guy here maybe has this blue one in the training set as, as the one nearest neighbor, and that's why it got the wrong label. So it looks like there's an overlap between those two classes, which is a very interesting insight, right? So maybe at the end, it's not two species, maybe it's only one species, right? And one should just say this is one species, but two colors, something like that. Good. So these steps are also very important, okay? Often machine learning in practice works like this. You get a data set, possibly in Excel, in your company that you founded or where you're working, and then you run your SK Learn mumbo jumbo and get an accuracy, and that's what you're reporting. And then your man manager says, so now, but what's going on? So why are you not better? And so you should be prepared for this question. You should look at the data. You should find out which examples are wrong. Can I see the pattern or something? So machine learning is not so automated at, end, at the end, but it's like machine and human learning at the same time. But you are more like the meta loop, and the machine learning is like the inner loop, OK? So that's like the what the typical data scientist is doing. Good. Next thing. Let's look at another supervised learning problem. Let's say a regression problem. So what is regression? The difference is, um, in the classification, the output was a discrete set of three different species. In regression, the output is also a continuous number. So what's the task here? We want to use the first three coordinates to predict the last coordinates. Okay, so then we have a regression problem. So can we predict the p tail length from the other three measured things? So that is the question that regression is doing. Why is it interesting? Yes, sometimes, I mean, many things are classification tasks, like dogs and cats or oranges and apples, all these things. But to predict the stock market, you want to predict continuous numbers, right? You want to predict real numbers, and not class labels. And then you are doing regression. Why is it still supervised? Because also here, yeah, the botanicist gives 75 examples to Ronald Fisher, but without the class labels. And the task is, to predict the last column from the first three columns. And again, there's a test set to check how good it is, okay, how good you can do it. Okay, here I don't have so much visualization. This is just the, the code. I'm using here linear regression, and again, we have a constructor for this. Then we call a fit function on some training that set, and here now the input are the first three columns, and the output is the last column. And in Python, you start counting from zero. So that's why the fourth column here is called three. And then we can print out some coefficient and some intercept. Now, what is this? This is basically a linear function that we learned. And those are the weights, those are the numbers with which you should multiply the entries in the first three columns. Yeah, you multiply them with these weights, and then you sum it up, plus the intercept. And then you can use that number to classify which is which. OK? So that's. Uh, no, in order to classify, then you, this number will be a good prediction for the um, fourth column. So let's look at the numbers. Again, let's go into the details here. So those are okay. It's important to look at the first one. 
but it looks like if the first one is large, okay, it means that the fourth one is small because it's a minus sign in front, okay? Then it says 0.25, and this one is also 0.25, kind of, and this is 55, okay, or uh, 54. So the third column has a much larger influence on the fourth column than the first two columns, right? So it even says if the third column has a large value, yeah, then that means that the fourth one has also a large value. In a way, it makes sense, right? So let's look at the table again. So that was the sepal length and width, and this is the petal length and width. So if there's in the third column a very large length for the petal, then most likely the width of the petal is also large, okay? So you can learn quite a bit from um, basically looking at these numbers. So they are not just numbers, that's a vector, but there's some meaning in here, okay, which is kind of interesting. Good, and then we can also predict some error, where here we use a squared error. It's kind of arbitrary, but yeah, we use it. And we see it's kind of, yeah, 3% or 3 something. The unit of this is kind of meter squares or centimeter squares. So on average, we are having 0 0.03 centimeters squared. So we should take the square root of that one, maybe. Actually, maybe that's a good idea. Let's do that. Then we have this, the right units, then we are again in centimeters. Square root not defined, that's too bad. That's really too bad. So import mass, so let's do it like this. So we see that in centimeters, yeah, our average error is like 0 0.19, okay? It's pretty good, two millimeters off, okay, yeah? So the one thing is, those are all numbers, right? And if you take a picture, you have a matrix of colors encoded by numbers. And what are the units there? Possibly, possibly photon counts or something, or maybe logarithmic photon counts or something. Here, the numbers are just numbers, right? But they also have units, they have centimeters. And so you can also interpret these things. You can give these numbers some meaning and you can also interpret them on a correct length scale, okay? Good, so here we, let's do the same thing. And that's weird. It's Typically in the test set, you have a larger error. Here you have a smaller error. Whatever, okay? We should look deeper into this. Maybe there's a bug in my code somewhere, okay? Okay, that is supervised learning. You are given input-output pairs. The output could be discrete or continuous, and then you have classification or regression, okay? Let's look at unsupervised learning. So now, what the heck is unsupervised learning? It's without a teacher. Um, so the teacher is, our botanicist, right? So still she's handing in the table of the 150 examples, or maybe only half the table. Let's, I'm not sure, yeah, let's, in machine learning, typically we only give part of the data. We keep some of it secret, right, to check whether the method works. So, but we don't give the outputs. We only give inputs here for training. So the um, function, the fit function now is only getting inputs and no outputs. So now what is unsupervised? Unsupervised means invent the outputs yourself. Okay, that might be a different phrasing like you know it already. So how is clustering inventing outputs? If you think about it, a clustering algorithm is trying to structure data by kind of finding subgroups which are similar and which are separated from other points, okay? And by this, you are basically inventing class labels in a way, okay? So you are inventing outputs and you are inventing discrete outputs. So in a way, clustering is like classification where you are not given the outputs, but you have to invent them yourself, okay? So that is clustering. That is actually a typical task of a botanicist or of an astrophysics guy, right, where you kind of get data from different stars, some light curves, and you should cluster them in different properties. And then you find out, wow, well, I call these one white dwarfs. I call these ones supernova. I call these ones the sun or whatever, right? So you can give different labels to it, but you first need to find out whether there are different groups. That is clustering. Again, we are calling the function fit, and then, then we can use it to predict something. And we are here predicting class labels without giving examples. Let's do that and let's visualize it. And now how am I visualizing this now? So I'm using the following way. So there's the color of these markers, and the color of the marker is the true species. I'm using that one, not for training here, just for visualization. And then there's the shape of my marker, and 
if there's only one cluster where all the Zetosa went, yeah, I'm only having a one entry in my legend. Okay, so there wasn't any Zetosa assigned to the other clusters. Otherwise, it would have appeared here in the legend. And also, when you look at this here, the green stuff all has the same shape. Now, what about the other ones? Looks like here's some mix up. So there's a large cluster of these circles, right? They are all where the color, and they have been assigned to the same cluster, to cluster number two. Then there are some of them, which are over here, closer to the red ones. They have been assigned to the other cluster, to cluster zero. Now, what about the Virginica? Most of them have been uh, assigned to the, the, the Raute cluster, and some of them to the circle cluster. But you can see here why, right? Because those are kind of close to each other, right? So that's why they appeared in the same cluster. And those up here are also close to each other. That's why they appeared in the same cluster. However, surprisingly, it kind of matches very well the true species, right? That you would get from also looking at the genome, maybe, in the extreme case, or looking at the colors or the texture or the smell of the, the plant or these kind of things, okay? So that is clustering. So here's the last one, right? O often, um, so let's make it, let's visualize it with a matrix. Let me press the right button. Ah, that works. So let's do something with chalk. How long do we have today? Until 12? Oh, that's really short. Maybe I'm, I'm talking too much, but um, let's see. So this is a function that we want to automatically program. It has some input, and it's generating an output. Or sometimes this is x and this is some y, OK? So now we can have a table. We can have supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And then we have a discrete x and we have a continuous x. So first question, supervised discrete x. Now what should I put in here? Any volunteers? If, even if it's too simple, then even nicer if you. Very good. And you don't have to give a hand sign. Just go ahead and tell it. What is that one? Continuous x, supervised. Just yeah. yeah. What about that one? Unsupervised discrete x. Clustering, very good. So typically, if you have a matrix like that, right, you also want something in here. Any suggestions? What could it be? What is the continuous? Ah, well, this is wrong. So this is y. Wow, surprisingly, you were able to answer the question nonetheless, even though it was wrong, um, the, how I wrote it up. So what would be a continuous output that I'm not giving at the beginning, right? And the computer should come up with it itself, OK? So what kind of methods are those? Any ideas? You can also give an example method if you know already one. OK, I tell you. So this is dimensionality reduction. A typical example is PCA, OK? So what is PCA? Suppose you have points on this sheet of paper, that is your data set, and it's kind of rotated in 3D space here. But when you look at it, there are only two directions which are relevant. So it would be nice to rotate the thing back, such that I have the directions of maximum variance as the first and second coordinate, and then the third coordinate is as variance zero. Okay, so PCA is kind of, or PCA or dimensionality reduction is giving us, given such a point cloud, yeah, that is on a two-dimensional manifold or on a two-dimensional sheet of paper, very flat, rotated in such a way that the first coordinate has the maximum variance, the second coordinate has the second maximum variance, and so on and so forth. Okay? That is dimensionality reduction. So where are the continuous co things here, the continuous y? Basically, we are inventing a new axis here okay, that gets computed from the inputs of my data here. And it gets kind of as a linear combination. I'm computing the coordinate here, and I'm inventing it in such a way that the variance is maximized, and I can also do it with the other one. Of course, this is PCA is linear. Everything is flat and nice, but you can also do it 
if your data set looks like this, like a Swiss roll or some complicated shape. However, then the mapping from here to here, yeah, it's a nonlinear mapping and it gets more complicated. But that's also dimensionality reduction, okay? So those are examples. That's applied here. Um, PCA, yeah, PCA would be applicable here. Okay, let me again roll it up. However, no matter how I turn it, there's no way to turn it such that the variance is zero. If I do it with a sheet of paper, I can turn it like this, and it's very flat. So the difference is, um, if I apply PCA, I will get three directions that have relevant variance. But if I do a nonlinear mapping that kind of unfolds the paper, I can have it only in two dimensions, which is nicer, right? Of course, there are surfaces. Suppose you have the surface of a sphere, yeah? With the surface of a sphere, there is no mapping into this space here. I mean, there is a mapping, like from the complex numbers onto the complex plane, or from the circle to the complex plane, but it goes to infinity, kind of, right? So there is one, sometimes, if you have a hole. So if you can, like, put a needle, have a north pole or something, then you can do something like this. So this is all dimensionality reduction. I'm inventing an output. So this perspective on these thing is a bit weird, but it's like our machine learning perspective. Machine learning is automated programming. Programming is coming up with functions f, programs f that turn an input into an output. Sometimes you're only having input and you want to learn something about it and invent something discrete for it or something continuous for it. So that's clustering and dimensionality reduction. Sometimes we already have the output given, like in a classification or regression problem, okay? Good, so far so good. Um, let me show you the, the PCA stuff. So PCA, as always, you have some generator, some, some, some constructor which is constructing you this PCA function or object. You fit it to the training data, and then you can print the explained variance of your um, directions. And here you find one direction which has a very strong variance and two other directions in this case which have a much smaller variance. So also this iris data set can be turned, rotated in space in such a way that one direction is um, kind of having the largest variance. So how does it look like? So let's take this one. I mean rotation, we are very good at rotation, right? So we could rotate it like that. Uh, so you see along this direction kind of now from left to right I'm having a large variance, right? And when I'm doing it like this and it's more like diagonal. So I need to kind of shift, turn it around a bit like that. And that's what PCA is doing. So let's plot it now in our new coordinate system. And in our new coordinate system now one of the axes here is having most of the variance and the other axis having the other variance, okay? So let's nicely rotate it, so maybe like this. So here you see now, now it's not going diagonally through this space, but now it's kind of going like horizontally through the space, okay? So that's the PCA thing, good. This thing has many names, Cahun-Löwe transformation, Hauptachsen transformation. There's a whole list, it's all PCA, in a way, right, a bit hand sha shady, hand shady, yeah, maybe that's a word. So there are many, many ways to think about it. At the end, it's always an eigenvalue problem, so that you need to solve, you have a matrix and you need to solve an eigenvalue problem. So here you're calculating the covariance matrix and you calculate the eigenvectors, that's the solution. We will talk about it, a whole lecture about PCA, okay, because it's lots of fun. Good, so far so good, so you see, yeah, all these superpowers that you learn in this lecture, classification, regression, right? They are really nice toolboxes that you can just use to apply to data, and it's really simple. But to really understand now what these numbers mean, like the coefficients of the linear regression, you also need to understand about the methods, what they're really doing, right? So you need to go into the gory details and poke around in it and find out what are those numbers, okay? Good, so far so good. Um, let's go back to the blackboard once more, right? I mean, okay, here was something missing, right? And so we were wondering, so what is going in here? But of course, there are discrete sets, there are continuous sets, maybe there's also something else, right? So it's interesting now to think about what else could there be, right? 
Why is it interesting? Because if you have a nice idea here, yeah, you can put something new here, a new category of learning or of statistical inference or something. Okay? And then you can write a paper and become a famous scientist. Okay? So it's also cool. Or maybe you're working for some telephone company and somehow you don't have discrete Y, continuous Y, but you have telephone Y, whatever that means. Maybe telephone is not an adjective, but telephonic Y, okay? And that's then super useful for the company. And suddenly you can do similar tasks. You could think about supervised learning, unsupervised learning in this new domain. So here's an example. You could have a graph structured Y. Okay, so what is that? So suppose um, the input is, um, the input here typically, my x, it's typically a subset of the r to the n in most application. It's like that, okay? So when I draw it, I just put some dots in here. So I could have some dots here. And those could be locations, but in principle it could be that, yeah, I could infer a graph in here, for example, the minimum spanning tree, right? So the minimum spanning tree is an algorithm which kind of is calculating us something down here in an unsupervised way. We have an algorithm that is calculating us a graph structured output, okay? So in a way, the MST would be something that could, could, could be down here. It could, but it could be also that you have a supervised one. You are a chemist, okay, and those are molecule, molecules, okay? And so you have a big data set of molecules and you know where the bindings are, okay? And then you have the 3D locations of the atoms from an electron microscope or something. And then you want to infer automatically the correct graph structure in here, okay? So that's very interesting, okay? That's a supervised task would be to go to the big data set of existing molecules and then find out for new ones. Unsupervised would be also interesting. You just go to your professor and says, oh, just give me the locations, I want to infer it myself. And I'm, then you can play around with algorithms to invent these kind of bindings and you could compare it with the truth, whether those are the bindings that are like theory, okay? And there are many other things that you could put, put here, some others, okay? What about having more rows? You can also have more rows in such a table, okay? So there's semi-supervised learning. So what is semi-supervised learning? It's basically a situation where I'm having a lot of x and some y's. Okay, so you have a lot of images from digits, but there are only some students who, uh, who help you with labeling the data set. And so you might have one million images of digits, but only 100,000 of them have a, have a label. And that's a semi-supervised learning setup. And the question is, can I make use of these 900,000 unlabeled examples, right? And you know already, we've seen already that sometimes the different classes that we have, they also nicely cluster. So maybe we can have a combination of classification and clustering and then make use of this additional unlabeled data set, okay? So that's super interesting. Um, and you can have it for this one, for that one, and then of course also for graphs, right? Why not? And then there are other setups, but let me put a double line here. So there's also reinforcement learning, which you might think fits into the list, but it's not fitting super well into the list because it's a different setup than this one, okay? Reinforcement learning is different. But maybe you find the right twist and we can also put it in here, but I couldn't find it yet. Okay, so far so good. So that is like a nice table giving you an overview. And in principle, you can put any machine learning method, you can put it in here somewhere, typically. The good thing is, now we can also assign algorithms to these situation. So we could have for classification, we could use a support vector machine. We could do some linear methods. We could do Gaussian process classification. There are zillions of different approaches that all do classification and they all solve this problem, right? So when you formulate it into one of these classes, your problem at hand, right? In your scientific project or in your industry project, then you can kind of go to SK learn and look at all classification algorithms and try them all out. And maybe one of them is kind of super good at your problem, okay? Then you can use it. Good, so far so good. So let's go back to the slides and let me find out how I'm doing it. You could press the right button. There we are. Good, so this was the Jupyter Notebook thing. 
So that's just what I said, told you just in words, okay? Those, this is the same stuff. So now what tools are we using in machine learning? Let me list a few of them. So we need probability theory. Why probability theory? Why? That's, that's so difficult with these conditioned on and possibly measure theory. Oh, it's getting really heavy. So let's look at the data again. So that was the iris data. And those are not perfect numbers, right? So those are like noisy numbers, right? Maybe the measurement hasn't been done by the botanicist herself, but by some students who weren't paid very well, okay? So the data is very noisy. And they kind of, yeah, kind of five centimeters. Here another one. Oh, this looks like that one, 5.2. Let's invent some numbers. And so there's some randomness involved here. So if there's randomness, should it stop us from doing machine learning? No, not at all. We should model it. So we should be able to express it. And for this, we need probabilities, okay? For this randomness, for this noise. And in particular, we need base rule. And that's a topic we will talk about on Wednesday. Uh, we need linear algebra. <coughs> You've seen already these vectors and uh, data matrices, right? Or data tensor. Does everyone know what a tensor is? By the way, yes? <coughs> no, very good, so ask it, so <coughs> because it's really simple. So a scalar basically has this shape, right? It's a real number. A vector has the shape r to the n. OK, now a matrix, and I should switch. Oh, we have the, the board. So a scalar is just a real number. A vector is a list of real number. A matrix is this. And now the question, of course, is what is that one? OK? And that's a tensor. And also if there are even more. OK? But finitely many. OK? So now the question is, is a scalar a tensor? Yeah, I would say yes, sure, yeah. A vector is also a tensor. A matrix is a tensor, okay? That's it. Now, what does it have to do with tensor that you know from mass? There was this complicated thing with these modulo spaces and stuff with tensor algebra, very complicated. It's the same thing, kind of, kind of, yeah? It's a different perspective on it. So it's about certain operations which should commute, and they only commute if you are in these modulo spaces, okay? Don't worry about it. For us, this is fine to so say this is a tensor. So it's just a, an ND array if you are in Python. That's a tensor. So don't be um, fooled if you, if you hear the word. Um, linear algebra is re really natural. Maybe when you're a first year student or like a beginner, you think, oh, why do I have to do all this? I mean, a, a vector is just a list, right? And a list is a basic data structure. Um, why is a list so basic in computer science? Because it's, it's a thing you want to process with a for loop, right? So a loop is basically like a list of things, a list of operations. So it's very natural. If you have a nested list, you have a matrix, right? If you have a nested, nested list, you have a tensor kind of, of operation or of data that you want to process, OK? So these things come very natural. So it's great to have these mathematics superpowers at hand that there are certain matrices, uh, that there are certain operations on vectors which can be described with matrices, the linear mappings, okay? And then it gets even better, right? When you have complicated functions like that one and you calculate the derivative of it or even having the Taylor expansion of it, then basically the first order expansion of the whole thing is described with linear algebra, right? You remember maybe that the gradient of a function is a vector Right, or they has the matrix, is the matrix, and that corresponds to linear algebra operations, right? So all these things, also for deep learning, they are based on linear algebra. You couldn't invent them without knowing linear algebra, okay? So it's very important. Now, oh, I was always very bad. I barely passed the linear algebra thing. It was so tough. It was pass, no pass. I could do a matrix inversion, but not more. Right, now's the time, right? Now's the time to use it. I hope now you will enjoy it with these kind of topics. I hope so. And if there's stuff that is unclear, please ask, okay? Good, next thing, optimization. Yet another topic. So we are going through all of math now, okay, as you see. But we are not using algebraic geometry. 
yet, right? Maybe in 10 or 20 years, but right now not. So we also have mathematical optimization. So this is about minimizing function, or the lecture is called numeric, yeah? Or I think in English, mathematical optimization, or this kind of thing. And um, so this is about, given some numerical function, how can I minimize it? How can I find zeros of it and all these things? And possibly with some constraints. Yeah? So how can we solve these kind of things? So that's also very important. What else? Then we need, of course, everything we know from computer science. And of course, it's an exaggeration, right? Um, that it's everything that you know. But if you are creative, you can transfer ideas from operating system, whatever, page faults. Maybe that corresponds to a crazy clustering method. I don't know. I mean, it can happen. So there are some weird algorithms like this floyd warshall algorithm. You use it for isomap, which is this problem of dimensionality reduction with nonlinear mappings, for example. And that's an algorithm on graphs, finding all pairs shortest paths. Okay, that's one that is not so close to machine learning first, but then when you know it, you suddenly see you can apply it. And the guys who found out wrote a, I think, a science paper on it, okay, which is like the creme de la creme in the publications. So the more you know, the better. Again, don't worry if you don't know these things yet. Uh, you will learn in this lecture everything you need to know for optimization and maybe a bit more. And you also learn linear algebra. I will also explain what eigenvalue decomposition is, or singular value decomposition. I will explain all these things. And you also learn about probability theory, okay? But like in a more like computer scientist fashion. Good, this is the tentative syllabus. And yeah, this is approximate. I'm already late, right? Today I wanted to do this probability as logic. Yeah? But I want to get rid of a couple of topics from this lecture, right? And then spend more time and having also a bit more programming during the lecture and having a little bit less material maybe. So that's the plan. So there's, when you go through it, there's always some of the lectures when I'm giving the lectures, then I'm starting to dislike it, the topic, and I want to kick those out, okay? Which I don't find very interesting. Good, so summary, blah, blah, blah. That's everything we talked about, and we talked about what is machine learning, and that's it for today, okay? So hopefully the recording worked. You can get it on the Mediathek, and I see you on Wednesday, or I don't see you on Wednesday, okay? So let's see what's happening. Oh.